Federated Tribes of Warm Springs, and I'll be moderating. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> over there. Um, so I'll be moderating tonight's panel, but I wanted to start out before we uh, get an opportunity to hear from these lovely ladies here. Uh, I want to read something that I picked up um, in the artist's repertory theater yesterday when we went to see a show. And I was really very, very um, guys said happy when I read this, and they, they actually read it on stage. But it's an acknowledgement um, that their theater rests on the traditional lands of the Wasco, Cowlitz, Clackamas, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. And it was really, I think, touching to be in a theater space and actually have a, a, a non-indigenous space start out in that way. It just <coughs> made me pause and say, I will definitely come back to this theater. So I, I, I wanted to read this because mm. it's on their wall. Um, they also have it posted um, in their, their brochure. So I have the great honor of being able to moderate tonight's panel put on by the Artist Repertory Theater with Naya and in sponsorship by Grand Ron Celeste and the Native Arts and Community Foundation. And we're here tonight to talk about um, responsibility to represent. These ladies are gonna share a little bit about their own responsibilities to their community and how their community inspires, empowers, and uh, helps them in the work that they do for the future generations of their own people and also indigenous artists. So I wanted to start out uh, by asking you each to introduce you and how their community inspires, empowers, and uh, helps them in the work that they do for the future generations of their own people and also indigenous artists. So I wanted to start out uh, by asking you each to introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about where you're from. Okay, um, woo. good evening. Um, my name is Mary Catherine Nagel. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. And I was born in Oklahoma and grew up in Oklahoma, Missouri, and Kansas. I now live um, on the Osage Reservation in Oklahoma and I'm a playwright and also a partner at a small law firm called Pipestem Law. And we do a lot of work representing tribes and tribal citizens. Um, our mission statement, I think, says something to the effect of we work to restore tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction, and we have a specific focus. Um, we do a lot of work around domestic violence and sexual assault, and specifically with the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act in 2013 with the tribal jurisdiction provision. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Osio, the Dawado, the Lanagay, Deanne Carol Chun, Studi Kaywood, Chi Chalagi, Ayaka, Oklahoma. Uh, hi, my name is Delina Studi. I'm a proud citizen of the Cherokee Nation from Oklahoma. Wado, uh, thank you for letting me be here tonight. Uh, it's really an honor. Um, my story is I'm, I'm an actor, and that's basically how I got started. And I got tired of waiting for someone to write me a good role, so I decided to write my own. Um, I also serve as the chair of the SAG AFTRA National Native Americans Committee, and I used to be the uh, former chair of the diversity committee there as well. Uh, so basically, my whole life has been dedicated to creating more roles for our people and to create more contemporary portrayals of our people. Um, and you know, I went like Mary Catherine. I grew up in Oklahoma, I, from a very, very tiny little town, and. Um, and like Mary Catherine, <laughs> we have, our, our family goes way back into a lot of Cherokee politics. Like if you were to study anything about the Trail of Tears or the removal, you'll find our family names there. And so everything I do is, um, I do it in the spirit of Gadugi, which is a Cherokee word that means the coming together of a people to celebrate, promote, and support each other. And so I just want to say thank you for being here tonight because you are participating in that spirit of Gadugi. So I do. Hello, so, um, I'm Larissa and I'm a um, member of the Sachanga Lakota Nation, and um, I just got really emotional, so give me a second. Um, <laughs> it's just it's so great to be here with these ladies. Um, 
I, I want to, uh, yeah, just also personally just acknowledge um, the ancestors that were here and acknowledge our elders. Um, we have elders that have been here like twice today. <laughs> uh, it's amazing. Um, thank you for being here. It's an honor to have all the elders here today. It's our honor to be with you, so thank you. And um, yeah, so I'm a playwright. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time. I'm really fortunate. It's, it's all I do. Um, it's my day job. And then I also um, have a consulting company called Indigenous Direction with Ty Defoe, who was, he was your speaker last year here for the high school. Um, so he, uh, he and I have a company where we help different organizations engage with indigenous art audiences and artists and kind of help bridge that um, often really uh, difficult cultural divide because people don't realize that we are completely different cultures. And um, so that's the other work I do in addition to, I guess I, I, we've created a, a day job <laughs> in addition to playwriting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wanted to start out with just uh, a, a question for you. I know that when I first stepped into theater was not until I left the reservation. I grew up in Warm Springs and there was no such thing as theater. We did a lot of acting, um, sort of acting crazy. We had a couple of good Easter plays. Um, I was a, a rabbit at one time. Um, it was a Christian play. Like that, but anyway, so what was the first time that you actually went into a theater Proper. And what was that experience mm. like for you? Um, what, at what time, you know, age were you? And then, and how did you feel? How did that make you feel? Well, I remember um, I was in middle school. I went to a middle school kind of in a, a rural area, and my mom. Uh, we had moved to Kansas after my parents divorced, and um, she got tickets to Phantom of the Opera. It was on tour in Kansas City, in like downtown Kansas City. So we like drove in and like went to Phantom of the Opera. And I just remember sitting there and watching, and the show was so epic and so big and so huge. And I was so caught up in it. And I just wanted to, I still do that on occasion. Um, and so, uh, so I was, you know, I was always kind of like a theater kid, uh, mostly just because to give my mother a break from having to put up with me. Um, but the first play I saw, uh, when I was seven years old, my dad and my mom decided that we should go back to the original homeland, so we went back to Gadua, North Carolina. So we went back to Cherokee, North Carolina, and I saw Unto These Hills. And what's funny is Larissa actually worked on that later on, not the production I saw because, yes. But anyway, <laughs> I remember when going- When she was seven. When she was seven, yes. But, it was, um, but my father was, thought it was very important that we see uh, our native storytellers doing a theater about our, our history. And you know, my father always impressed upon me at a young age that you know, we're native, so we're the original storytellers. And so that's kind of our, our job, is to keep the stories going. And then when I was 12 years old, I became really shy. I have severe social anxiety. I'm a big introvert, um, but I can, as an actor, I can pretend that I'm not, so. <laughs> and so when I was a freshman in high school, my father uh, picked out all my electives. I was doing speech and debate and drama, <laughs> and I hated it. And then I, too, went to a theater camp that the Cherokee Nation actually put me through, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it was then that I really loved it, to the point when I came back uh, my sophomore year, I, I was qualifying in all this speech debate rounds, like I, you, there were 13 events and you, you can only qualify for 11, so I qualified for all 11, but I was so addicted to it, I loved it so much that I would show up to get, get on the bus and pray that one of my teammates wouldn't show up and then I could pretend to be them and then I'd qualify under their name. So, um, in fact, to this day, I, I still have the most qualifications. Like, there's a plaque with all the stuff I've qualified for, both under my name and all the names that I used. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I grew up in South Dakota, um, and I was really fortunate. We moved to the big city when I was in first grade, so it was Pierce. It was 13,000 people, which where I'm from is, and we had a Walmart and a Kmart. What? I know, it's huge. Um, the only one for, you know, 150 miles. But, um, yeah, so I, so I lived in the big city. So we had a community theater there. We didn't, Winter didn't have any theater. Pine Ridge, I mean, Rosebud didn't have any theater. Um, we had none of that. But when I got to Pier, we had um, community theater. We didn't get, like, touring shows or anything like that. But um, I, I actually, though, I wasn't a theater girl at all. I was a classical ballet dancer for the first 10 years of my professional career. 
Um, and so I was pretty much on my own out there alone in South Dakota trying to be a ballet dancer. Um, there's a whole play coming about that, Children's Theater Company in Minneapolis. I'm working on it with KU right now. Um, but yeah, so that, uh, so I, I wasn't really into theater, so I'd go. My parents were really into the arts. Um, they both played musical instruments. I was terrible terrible at musical instruments. Um, I sang in choirs and things and did all that, but I, I was never into theater, so I, I, I'm still not a theater kid. I, like, I won't go to a play unless I absolutely have to. Um, I, I'd rather go to a ballet, I'd rather go see, hear music, I'd rather see art, um, fine art, uh, that's what I do. I'd rather go to, I'd rather go to, I've been to, I've been to powwow here in the back, I, but I hadn't like ever been to, a, I've never been to a play here. <laughs> it's kind of horrible in all my trips here. Um, I'd rather do that, and that's our, but that's our form, right? That's what we do as indigenous people. We have our own forms of performance that we've had for thousands of years, and that's theater. And um, that's the thing for me that constantly makes me crazy. There is no difference. And I'm always going on, I work with a lot of youth, you know, saying you are already doing don't have to change it. You don't have to alter it. You do what you do, and I will just help you like, like make it into what, whatever it is you want it to be. I will help you make it into that. If you want to keep it with the community, I will just help you work with the community. If you want to make, put it on a stage, I'll show you how to put it on a stage without sacrificing who you are and who we what we bring as indigenous people and that's really what I try to do with other people in theater and then my job is to write plays so whatever <laughs> which is great too it's fine well there were a couple of really interesting points um Delaney, you had mentioned that we were we are the original storytellers you know that's something that our people have been doing for a really long time and I'd, I'd like you guys to expand on that um you know as playwrights you are writing stories you're writing stories about your communities about our experiences as indigenous peoples you're writing for our own people but you're also writing for different communities and cultures and so you know i, I went to the play yesterday and and um i was the annoying person part of the commentary at the end i don't know if people appreciated that but i you know it just really kind of it, it there was a moment in the play that made me really uncomfortable and I was like I'm uncomfortable as a native person in this play and then I'm turning around and I'm looking at all of the non-Indian people and I'm like I really hope you guys are as uncomfortable as I am <laughs> um, it was one of those experiences where you, you're you're a part of this experience and it just sort of makes you stop and and there's some real power in that for a native person I think sitting in there to feel that so I'd, I'd like you to talk about um, uh, um, about that particular piece and just kind of, I think, pushing the boundaries not only for our own community but for other communities. Yeah, that was actually my play, um, Thanksgiving play. Um, yeah, there is a, there's one scene. So this, so the unofficial, well, actually now it's official because um, William Met Weekly quoted me saying it. So the unofficial <laughs> tagline that I give to this play is that I make fun of nine, we have white people for 90 minutes, which is actually only 80 minutes, but when people laugh, it's 90 minutes. So that's really <laughs> what it is. Um, <laughs> so I just, it's crazy. So it's, it's, it's a bunch of white folks being ridiculous. Um, Well-meaning liberal white people. Oh, hey man, it's the baby. Hi. Um, <laughs> so, uh, there's so many people I know now here. It's so great. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so that's, that's basically what the play is. But within that, these well-meaning white folks are trying to create a play that is about um, Thanksgiving, Native American Heritage Month, politically correct, but they're doing it without any Native people um, and still trying to be correct about it. So there is a scene in it where they reenact an actual historical event. And, um, and it's, it's something that happened, and it's very horrific and, and gruesome, and it's unfortunately true. Um, and uh, I personally really pushed hard, with, and with my director here, who's here, Luann, um, we pushed really hard to make it as graphic as possible within the confines of the show, which is people making something up in a room. You know, what can they make from this room that makes it as graphic as possible? And um, the reason for that is, is really what you're talking about, right? That, um, it's amazing how many people um, still have no clue, like how horrific 
genocide is. <laughs> like, it's no joke, right? We all know that. And, and yet they don't, they really don't know. And so I do use it, um, so my, my play is both comedy and satire. So that's part of the satire, right? It, it seems like a comedic moment as we start it. Um, this kind of depicting this horror and they're doing it, you know, to like show the horrors of what we did and we, we're facing our reality. And then the satire of it, you know, generally, and the gentleman that's here um, spoke about this earlier is, you know, you laugh in the moment because these characters are kind of ridiculous, even though they more ridiculous because you know them um, and you walk in, run into them in Portland every day. But also, um, they uh, right, <laughs> and um, but then also a, a lot of folks have said to me afterwards, like, whoa, whoa. then I, I, I had this. Once I stop, be careful. It's like with clowns, right? Be careful when the laugh stops right and like once it's the laughter stop they're like wow I what it, what was I laughing at and should I be laughing at that and how real is that and what does this mean and and what does it mean by the for the person next to me and um I was really it's been lovely because last week we had so many indigenous folks coming to the play it was really great and I, it's funny because I had people saying I had a white guy next to me that was like do you mind if I laugh at this like, you know, they're like checking in with the native people and, and they're, I mean, the native folks were laughing, but you know, it's just, it's um, something that I really use humor to disarm folks and then kind of once they're kind of disarmed, then use the mirror to look at yourself and, and think about why you're laughing at these things. Oh, goodness. Um, so yes, I mean, similar to what Larissa does, uh, my show is a, a nice blend of unpacking the history behind the Trail of Tears and also telling it from a modern day perspective. And I've had so many people that have seen the show and would say, oh my gosh, I didn't think the Trail of Tears could be that funny. And, or that we didn't expect to laugh so much. And it's, I feel like as Native people, if you only see us on TV or in the films, we're always very stoic. They don't really know that we have a sense of humor. And I think that's how we survived for as long as we have, with so much intact, is we can find the humor in things. We find the reason to laugh. We find that motivation to keep going. And, you know, it's wonderful. I think one of my favorite things is whenever I'm doing my show, because I'm also performing my show. So not only did I write it, I'm also the, person, the only person on the stage doing it. And so I can hear the audience, which is a lot of fun for me. So a lot of times they're like, the non-natives in the group will be like, wait, what did she say? Did that really happen? <gasps> and it's just that you hear them reacting, right? So, um, and that's a lot of fun for me because we're trying to unpack a lot of history that a lot of people don't know. Um, and how do we make it entertaining? And also how do we get the point across? And I feel that's one of the great things about theater instead of film and television is it's a wonderful educational tool that's also entertaining. And because people see a real live human being on the stage, it's easier for them to relate to us because we're not separated by that glass. And I think that's one of the ways that we kind of rehumanize who Native people are, especially to non-Native people who have never met any of us. You know, I've, it's not uncommon for me to do a project and I'm the only Native in the room, and then they expect me to be the ambassador of all things Native, which is always kind of fun for me. And so sometimes I joke around with people and I, I lie to them. You know, like, oh, no, no, yeah, that's, no, that's how we, yeah, if you, if you lie, we have to cut off that finger. You know, really, and they're like, oh, okay. And you, I mean, it's just fun just to watch them, like, <laughs> think you're serious. But I got that from my father. But, um, but it's, you know, it's, I, I feel like every minority has that responsibility, and it's also a burden of always having to educate. You know, we always have to educate the dominant society about who we are, and it, it starts weighing on you. And so, um, I think that's the, one of the great things I, I had fun with in my show is I actually kind of address that. And I, I kind of, you know, we, we show it to them. We, we shine the light back on you and all of a sudden we make the people in the audience uncomfortable. I think a good piece of theater or any kind of art makes you question your privilege. And we all have privilege in some way, shape or form, but I, anytime that it makes you uncomfortable, then we're doing a good job. That's what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Me? Oh, okay. <laughs> what can I add? Um, yeah, I completely agree. It's, it is interesting. Uh, I, I had Sovereignty this last uh, couple months ago in D.C., and then Manhattan just opened at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and I've had numerous people come up to me and say, wow, 
I, your play hat was funny. And you know, and I'm like, well, what'd you expect it to be? It's, it's a piece of theater, you know, like, yeah. And they, but they're shocked that they laughed. And I think they think a native play, it's gonna be super serious, you know, and it's not gonna be funny. And um, I think, you know, completely agree, you have to open people's hearts and minds because there's a reason our, our stories have been silenced. There's a reason they're not, you know, until this time, not being told in history books and on the American stage, right? I mean, if you bring us out of the past and into the present, that kind of jars the American manifest destiny. We deserve to be here. We're, we're the most successful nation in the world. Yay, democracy. All of that, right? So, you know, if you can make people laugh and invite them in that way, then I think people are much more open to hearing the ultimate message you have to share. And then I think there's a question of how do you share that message? And I, I don't have all the answers. I'm still learning because um, you learn from your audience when you, when you craft the story. And I will say, in Manhattan, there is a scene um, where a scalping takes place. And I really, had, I really talked to the actors in the show and said, I don't, I don't know if this should be in here. I mean, it, it happens, but maybe we don't need to see it on stage. You know, and it's um, in the early 1600s when the Dutch just started massacring the Lenape on Manhattan Island. And I really felt like, you know, because I, I, yes, I want to educate the non-natives who are going to come and who maybe didn't even know the Lenape ever existed or that Manhattan, Manhattan is named after their own word for the island, their home, um, that they were forcibly removed from after lots of violence. Um, you know, so I want, I want to confront non-natives with that reality, but I also don't want to harm my own people. I don't want my own people to come inside the theater and have to watch something that triggers them, because we all carry that historical trauma. Even if we don't consciously think about it, it's inside us, because you know, we're here today, because at some point, someone that we descend from uh, survived, right? Survived what was, what has been one of the most successful genocides in the history of mankind. So, you know, I want to be very, um, aware of how my play impacts the native people who come see it. I don't want to cause more harm. I don't want to trigger people. But then I can't back away from showing the past and showing me what's happened. Um, and so that was a conversation. And I don't, I don't know that the play has the right balance right now. I'm, I think I have to constantly ask that question. And I have to ask people how they react to it when they see it. Does, how does this make you feel? Does this um, trigger you? Does this hurt? Does this, you know, and, um, but the interesting thing was is that all the native actors in the show, and they're the ones, you know, who I, I want to really listen to because they're on stage doing it. And that's a whole other energy too, to have to, to show that violence on their bodies, right, with their voices. And they said, no, this has to be in here. Um, we can't just have it happen off stage and then find out about it later through a character telling us. Like, we, this, we ha because this is what our ancestors survived, we have to show this. And so that was the conversation we had and that was the decision that was made. But these are, these are tough decisions and I think with everything you have to think about, your audience is native and non-natives and what does that mean for the story that you're sharing and how you, and how you share it. Well, and you always have to go back to community, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's something, I, I, like I'm doing a play about the Dakota War of 1862, and they, the Dakota community said, don't depict the hangings. So I was like, great, I'm not going to depict the hangings. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, that's for them, um, it's with everything that just happened with the Walker, it's a hugely traumatizing event right now. Mm -hmm. And so they said, you know, we, we don't want that done. And that's, I think that's what we all very much respond mm -hmm. to is, you know, going back to community, figuring out what doesn't want to be, what they don't want to see on stage, and then saying, great, so what is it you do want to see on stage? And because it's their story, it's not mine. I'm Lakota, I'm not Dakota. And so asking them, what is their, their what do they want to see? And then what, what do you want to teach to white folks? And then my job is to translate all that and make it translate into Western theater and, and make sense to white people. So thank you. Um, one of the things that I, that I uh, am hearing is um, from all of you is just about the power of theater in general. You know, we often talk about art as being this incredible catalyst to create change in communities. Um, on the Oregon Arts Commission, one of the things that we get to do is read a lot of grants, and you, you really start to see how art becomes this tool to have difficult conversations in a lot of communities, you know, to create a space to actually do that. Um, you guys work with Native youth, and I know that um, in my own community of Warm Springs, 50% of our tribal membership is under the age of 30. And so that's like 
50% of our tribal membership. It blows my mind when I think about how young our community is mm -hmm. and how you're starting to see these really um, kind of cool, well, I'm not cool anymore. I'm not at the cool age, according to the young <laughs> It hurts my feelings to know this, but, um, so, you know, they're doing these really cool edgy projects and we, many of us, I think, have been doing an, different art with young people and I'm curious to know what sort of art, if it's in the theater or other types of art that you're doing in your own communities and other communities, especially with youth and what you're seeing in that type of space with young people. Oh, wow. Hi. I guess I'm starting. <laughs> I love it when I see both of you looking at me. Um, so we did that to you last talk. Um, hey. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I work with youth a lot. Um, but you know, there's so many different ways, right, that I work with youth. So I, I tie to phone, I do a lot of workshops, um, uh, helping youth bring out their own voices in whatever way they want to do that. Um, but additionally, um, I think what I'll talk about for a second is what, like for instance, what we're doing here at the theater, at Artist Repertory Theater, right? Um, what I, I have two requirements of every theater company I work with. They, I cannot be the only indigenous art in that season, and I cannot be the only indigenous person paid in that season. And every theater company that works with me has to be down with that. And thus far, they've done great. So for instance, since we're talking about Warm Springs, um, one of, you know, our theater company, Artist Rep, uh, they didn't have any grants, they didn't have anything for this, but they said, well, we have space, we have a bunch of people in the lobby, we have, you know, we, there, these are the things we have. Um, are you interested in any of these things? And we've spent the past year going out into the community, talking to Native folks, saying, what are you interested in? And um, what we've ended up with was a lot of youth doing this amazing stuff. <laughs> like, um, we had, um, you know, we've had uh, Scott Kalama from, and his whole crew came down doing hip hop in the lobby. Um, and and I, you know, that's obviously one of the big ones, right, that we're seeing again and again. And I'm um, figuring, um, and so they've came out, that whole crew from Warm Springs came out and performed in the lobby. We've had Strict Nine and um, uh, Fish Martinez came out and uh, who else? Uh, West Coast Black Bear, you know, all these amazing young men who are trying to be positive role models in the community and doing their own art forms. And we've, it's been really great because I, I feel like um, it's, it's important for, because so many of our youth are doing that work, right? And so it's important to show them that like, you know, there's actually an audience for you here in the theater in what you think of as you know, a bunch of old white people. Um, <laughs> Strict Nine of the Night had all these old white ladies with their hands in the air and they were just like having such a great time. It was amazing. Um, and so, you know, it was great. And I don't know if they've ever, I don't know if they even knew why, but they're like, okay, he told me to do it. You know, like <laughs> they're just having such a good time. Um, and I think it's important, you know, in talking to these young, young folks and, and, um, and also our own uh, <laughs> uh, River here, I mean, uh, River, I just said your last name, sorry. Um, <laughs> but you know, that works too. Um, but yeah, having all these young folks coming in and doing the work they do, doing spoken word poetry and all the stuff that they're doing, is showing them that there is a place for them in theater. And if they want to do, you know, work just, in, if they want to work in bars and whatever, that's great. But if they want to work in theater, there are places and there are ways then to take that work and translate it into a full length Play into a full evening of theater that these ladies would love to come to, you know, because they had such a great time in the lobby. So I think it's really, for me, it's always about with our youth, like meeting them where they are. What are they interested in? What are they doing? What are they talented at already? And then how can I help them translate that if they want to onto a stage or just into the lobby? It's fine, whatever that is. Um, or back home with their people and really support them in. Um, in their writing process and their professional process and help them to really bring those, those ways of performing and doing things back to their people and in different venues. So for me, um, growing up in the middle of nowhere, Oklahoma, no one ever came to my school to validate my culture, mm -hmm. uh, which is really kind of funny considering I lived right in the heart of the Cherokee Nation. No one ever came to my school and said there were creative career options. Uh, you know, if you were lucky in my small town, you get to work at the chicken, fan, the chicken plant, you know, or the factory, or maybe you, if you're really lucky, you get to be a teacher. And those were your options. And so, uh, you know, and I knew from my family, you know, we have, we, my, if you go to the Cherokee Nation, the head of the genealogy is my Aunt Eliza. Uh, the head of the, the language department is John Ross and David Crawler. And those, those are my, these are my, fa that's my family. So we, we've I made it. I related to John Ross. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> John Ross is descended from Andrew Ross? Mm hmm We? Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's a whole, yeah. <laughs> Signed the same treaty as my grandfather. Okay. It's, it's 
history's complicated. Yeah, sometimes. wow. Yeah. And so, wow. Um, but yeah, so it's, yeah, so I knew my family was active in the culture, but no one ever told me that. And no one ever told, you know, the other native youth at my school, and my school was mostly native. And so it was very important to me that, uh, that I, I go out and I talk about that. And so I've been very lucky that when I first moved to Los Angeles, I got to partner up with the National Conference for Community and Justice. Uh, Christopher Sebo's right back there, and he designed the first set of my first equity play, which was a one-person show called Kick that explores uh, the power of mascots and the power of images. And uh, I came on board when it was just a rough outline of what they wanted, and it was with Peter Howard mm -hmm. from Cornerstone as well. He had written it, um, and so they wanted to make the character Cherokee, so I was able to introduce the language, I was able to introduce songs, and at the end, I, you know, one of the things I told to Peter, I was like, it's very important to me that Grace, the character I'm playing, doesn't win, right? Because I want her to still find the ability to get up and keep fighting. Because as you know, especially if you're a Native person and you're fighting any kind of issue, you know, treaty rights, you know, mascots, representation, you're not gonna win. But you have to keep getting up every day and keep the fight going. And so it was through the NCCJ that I was also able to be a counselor for the Brotherhood Sisterhood Camp. And so that was a week-long camp where we took, uh, oh gosh, about 200 youth from across Los Angeles. And we talked about all the isms. You know, we, we unpacked everything. And then it was through them that I was able to work with City of Peace, where we take inner city kids and we create musicals. And then um, I also did some Native playwriting programs and mentor artist playwriting programs and Young Native Voices. And I went with the Tribal Touring Company for the American Indian Film Institute and I mentored Native kids because it's very important, especially, you know, once again, this is me coming from me and knowing that no one ever told me my voice was important or that my story had value. And not ever seeing myself represented on television or film, it's very lonely, it's very isolating, especially to our young people. And when you think about it, we have the highest suicide rates and the highest dropout rates. So how do we build up this self-esteem? How do we make them be proud of who they are and where they came from? And how do we restore that and let them know that they're important? So I think one of the most powerful things I was able to do is I, through all these programs, I was able to teach playwriting to these young incarcerated native men. And in California, you know, it's the three stri strikes rule. And so these are poor native young men under the age of 18 who are in prison because of petty theft or drug abuse, and yet, because they did it three times, instead of getting the help they need, they're sent to a prison. And because most of them come from reservations that are very poverty-stricken, they didn't have family to come see them. And so, you go and you help them tell their story, and it's, I think it's a vital point, you know, part of who we are. Once you own that story, once you tell the story in your own words, then it doesn't have power over you, you have power over it. Mm -hmm. And so that was the one thing that was very important to me is how do, we get, <coughs> how do we take our power back and how do we start telling our own stories from our own perspectives and how, to, how do we re, you know, reignite that flame inside of us because we're a proud people, we're a resilient people and by God we're still here. And so that's one of the things that I like to do with the Native youth and I, you know, I've, I've been very lucky and fortunate that through every organization I, I work with, I always find a way to get back into the organization. So right now, you know, working with Portland Center Stage, we're creating a, a curriculum to go with the show, and I'm teaching a bunch of workshops. In fact, we're, we're, every day I keep getting more and more workshops to work with the Native youth and also non-Native youth, which I, I think is equally important because they need to know how to have these difficult conversations. And how do we start bridging that gap? And it was so funny because, you know, my father gave me uh, my name is Delana Gay Estude, uh, which means, and I didn't figure this out until later in life, and it, my dad made fun of me. He's like, I was wondering how long it would take you to figure that out. <laughs> but my name means Golden Gate, and I was supposed to be a bridge, and so that was the, what my father has given to me, and I've, I've taken that on. That's what I'm trying to do, is how do we bridge that gap? How do we make it accessible? How do we start having these difficult conversations? And how, as Native people, do we start claiming our own stories and taking back our power? What she said. <laughs> um, I really don't have much else to add to that. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I will. I will say. I, I just. I agree with everything 
they just both, um, Larissa and Delana just said, and I think that uh, one thing I've learned too in working with youth is, you know, uh, you know, I think when I first started doing anything with youth, um, I thought, okay, how do I change what I'm doing to work? And you don't, you don't have to change anything. You don't have to do it different. You know, kids are so smart. They're so smart. And so I think that was one major epiphany for me. It was like, oh, in some ways they're smarter than adults, right? Because they don't have all those filters that adults have. By the time we're adults, we've, we've put up all these walls and these barriers. And, and I actually feel like the you know, the work that I have been able to do with youth, I've taken away more probably than what I've been able to give them. So, um, and I think, I think there's a lot of power in, in theater, specifically when you, take, when you do it with youth, because, you know, our kids aren't, aren't allowed to share their stories, and they don't get to see themselves. And I, um, one, of our, one of the plays I've been taking around the country that actually Delaine has been in a few times is Sliver of Full Moon. And uh, it's really cool because sometimes we'll take it to a community and we'll work with their high school students to, to be in the play. And um, the number of times I've had kids come up and say, I've never, I've never seen you know, one of my people on stage before. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, oh, you know? But I mean, I, rem I remember that feeling personally. You know, I, I, I mean, I still feel that way. It's like, can I just see Native people on stage? Like, <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Well, there were a, a couple of things that I heard um, from you. Delena, you had talked about, you know, writing a story, you know, it doesn't have power over you, and you sort of take that back. And, and um, Mary Kay, you mentioned earlier uh, when you were talking about the law firm that you recently joined, the work that they've done on the reauthorization of VAWA. And I just kind of want to turn this a little bit to talk about women, Native women in general, because there really has been this really interesting sort of Me Too movement happening across the country, but kind of crickets when it comes to Indian country. And uh, just watching and watching what's out there, but then also knowing um, we have a mutual friend her and I, so we were kind of chatting about that earlier, but just these conversations with other Native women about the incredible um, levels of sexual assault and things that women are experiencing and how silent those stories actually are in Indian country. Like, we don't want to talk about it because it's really ugly and uncomfortable, but the reality is is that it's, it's everywhere. It's literally everywhere. I mean, all the Native women that I'm friends with have all been a victim of sexual assault. And, when I lived in Minneapolis going to graduate school, we had done a production of the Vagina Monologues, which was interesting to be on stage talking about your vagina. Um, but also just, you know, kind of one of those things where it wasn't written by indigenous peoples. Um, so it, it was kind of a, it was a different experience. Um, but I, I'm kind of waiting now for the stories, like when, when and how do we start having these conversations? It, it may be through, you know, sort of creating a, a place that's not as uncomfortable where we can laugh about it, but also really start to have some of those hard conversations and dialogues in our communities about how women are treated, um, the, the high levels of sexual assault. So I'm just curious to know from you, it, because you guys are writing these types of stories. You're, you're putting these stories out here. It's powerful, the work you do. How do we begin? to have those conversations through a medium of theater and through art? Well, <laughs> I very much believe in theater and art as I think one of the most effective ways to have these conversations. And that's one of my problems with the Me Too movement. I think it's very important. I'm, I'm glad it's happened. I think we're now kind of at this place where it, it, it was disruptive in, in a very um, helpful way. But now, if the conversations can't leave social media and happen in rooms like this, then what are we doing with it, right? And so I feel like it's, it's just a hashtag right now. And I'm not sure how much of an in-depth conversation we're really having. But um, I think that's yet to be seen. And I think we can, we, can still, um, we can still have that conversation. But I have a play uh, called Sliver of Full Moon. Actually, we brought it out to Umatilla. Mm -hmm. um, Last year. You were in it. Yep. Yeah. That was like a year ago. <laughs> um, she was the star. And um, she's an amazing actress in addition to being a phenomenal playwright. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I don't think it's a, a coincidence that we've got three women up here. And I think about, um, and, you know, and, 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 you know, 
Cherokee culture is very mm -hmm. matrilineal, but we think in a lot of different, I don't want to be super general, over general and pan Indian, but a lot of our tribal cultures uphold that you know the women are the foundation of sovereignty. We literally wouldn't have citizens of our nations if it weren't for women, right? We are the life bearers, we give life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's also not a coincidence that one of the biggest victories in the history of the United States for tribal nations came from women. Mm -hmm. Vi the Violence Against Women Act in 2013, Congress and the President restored a piece of the tribal criminal jurisdiction that the United States Supreme Court took away. So we've got all these hundreds of years of United States history of the three branches of federal government taking our sovereignty away, taking our jurisdiction away, and all of a sudden a piece of it gets restored. Why? Because Native women, leaders and survivors, went to D.C., met with Congress, and told their stories like Lisa Bruner from the White Earth Nation or Diane Millich from Southern Ute. And they told their stories in the New York Times, they told their stories in congressional hearings. And, and, I, and I think, again, that just goes back to the power of storytelling and what happens when silenced voices speak up, right? And so Sliver of Full Moon celebrates that victory, celebrates the restoration of tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians in VAWA 2013. And it's been a real blessing to take it around the country. We've taken it to um, you know, Umatilla, we took it to Fort Berthold and did it um, with MHA Nation. We took it to Eastern Band and did it in Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, it's been a huge blessing and I think it's also been powerful because uh, it, when we bring it into a community, um, there have just been, the, inevitably people will come up afterwards and, and the women share their stories, I mean, if they can make it. So I always invite the women, I, in writing the play, I did interviews with survivors, and um, they're invited to sh literally share their story on stage. If they can't make it or they don't want to, then we'll hire a very talented actress to play them. Um, but but they have that opportunity. So oftentimes when we do the play, um, you know, you're listening. Diane Millich is sharing her story, right? Lisa Bruner is sharing. Billy Joe Rich, and I think that um, is even another level of theater of storytelling where you can't. You can't separate yourself. You can't say, well, this is just a story that this fancy playwright made up. But no, it's, it's very real. And someone's giving testimony right now to what they've survived. What I've heard um, in, from some of the tribal communities where we've, we've gone to is that afterwards, the conversation continues. Mm -hmm. And people start saying, well, who, who in our community has survived this? And who's perpetrated it? Mm -hmm. Because that's the unfortunate thing. Yes, the Department of Justice shows the majority of violent crimes against, and we know our women face the highest rates of sexual assault, murder, and rape in the country, right? Mm -hmm. And the majority of those crimes, the Department, Department of Justice reports, are committed by non-Indians. We also know we have people in our own communities, mm -hmm. right? Our uncles, our, our fathers, our grandfathers, our neighbors. And it's not just, um, you know, man on woman, it's women on men, and women on women, and I mean, it's, right? And, and those are the conversations I think are really hard to have in our community. And so I think theater, again, offers this uh, unique environment in which these conversations can start in a way that, you know, it's not going to happen in a tribal council meeting, okay? It's just, it's just <laughs> uh, you know, and, um, or, you know, other settings. And so that's where I think the power of theater as, as a creating a space for healing and testimonials is really at its, at its height. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So one of my favorite stories that my father told me when I was a little girl, when I was four. Um, so if you, if you know anything about the Cherokee history, in 1763, we were considered a world power. In fact, we were sending people, we were sending emissaries of peace over to London to, uh, to negotiate with the kings and queens. You know, we were, we were working, we were traveling, we were getting the message out, but we were considered a world power. And my favorite story growing up, so most people, you know, you have bedtime stories. My dad was like, my mom would come in and tell me like the three little pigs and Wonder Woman would make an appearance in their Scooby-Doo, right? My dad would come in and be like, okay, so in the 1770s, <laughs> Chief Atakushkala was invited to talk to the British Treaty Party. And he was told to bring his council. So Chief Atakushkala showed up with his beloved men and women. And when they walked in, they looked around, and the first thing Chief Atakushkla says is, when he sees all these you know, men with the powdered wigs and the red coats, is, where are your women? Right? And so, um, and of course, the British delegation said, oh, our women, you know, we don't involve them in matters of, of state. 
And Chief Adekashla turns back to our people and says, we can't trust them. They're only thinking with half of their brains. <laughs> and <laughs> that was my bedtime story. <laughs> so, and so my father, you know, I, was, I always joke that I, you know, I, I didn't grow up with gender roles because work was work. If you were available and you could do the work, you would do the work. So sometimes I was helping whoever was cooking in the kitchen or sometimes working on the car. The rule in my family's house was if you cooked, then you didn't have to clean, mm -hmm. right? So you, if you had one of the two jobs. And so, and my parents would delegate that duty. And so, you know, I grew up knowing that women were powerful, that women were sacred, and that women were honored. And if you look at the history of the Trail of Tears and the Cherokee Nation, uh, one of the ways they got us was they started saying that the Cherokee Nation were a petticoat government. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, had that was a big part of my play. I cut it because my play is already two hours long, and it, <laughs> the first draft was six hours, and I can't put the, I can't do that to myself <laughs> or to you. And so, but it's a lot of history. But it was that was one of the ways they were trying to undermine us by is by saying, you know, oh, you're a petticoat government. So. Uh, and then what happened was the removal happened and we get to Oklahoma and they draft a new constitution which was actually drafted by my fourth great grand uncle George Lowry and he purposely left out women's rights. So our constitution changed once it got to Oklahoma. And even though it wasn't written down, it was, it was still implied that we had rights. But it was one of those little silent agreements we had like okay, because they might try to move us again. We gotta make sure we, we play by the rules or at least appear like we are. And so, you know, I grew up with all these stories knowing about that, and, and my father was always good about having the most awkward conversations with me in regards to like gender and sex and everything. And so, you know, I, I do think, you know, exactly what Mary Catherine was saying. We have this wonderful ability, especially with theater, because once again, it's a real person on a stage feeling feelings, right? Those aren't artificial, those are real feelings. And the people in the audience feel that, right? They're the, well, most people don't realize this, the audience is the other character in a show. Mm -hmm. And what you give to us, we feel and we take it in and it, it, it really impacts our performance. And so, um, and there have been studies have shown that if you're in an audience, uh, your heartbeats sync up to each other. It's a very communal event. And, you know, and I've been very lucky with most of the plays I do are very, uh, they're very social justice plays and most of them actually um, have a facilitated dialogue afterwards. We actually have a, a facilitated dialogue before, and then we do the performance and then we unpack it afterwards. But it's creating that safe space to have those conversations. And I, you know, if you look at the history of assimilation, and you know, most, my, my father is a boarding school survivor, where he was you know, forcibly removed, sent to a boarding school where he had the Indian beaten out of him, and they actually tried to enforce the gender roles. And, you know, it's, it's, so it's, to me it's, you know, not to give people excuses, but it's no wonder that even though elder abuse and domestic abuse, uh, they, there wasn't something we really dealt with back in the day, but it's something we learned and it happens today because that abuse, is, it's a cycle. And so whenever you take a child from their parents, you put them in a military type school where they're not receiving any love or affection and, whenever they get out of that school and they have children, they're gonna, that's what they're gonna show, that's, what they're gonna, that's how they're gonna treat their kids because they don't know any better because that's what they learned. And so we have to unbreak that cycle and the best way to do that is by having these difficult conversations. And my father, you know, he was a, he was a boarding school survivor and I, you know, he, he has moments. And so we, we actually had to have several conversations talking about, you know, abuse and mistreatment and you know they're not fun conversations to have but until you start having them you're not going to be able to move forward and so that's one of the great things that I think theater is a wonderful tool because you do have that community experience you're all watching it together and hopefully you saw it with somebody that's a friend and then when you leave you can unpack it or talk about it more but I think it's I think it's a great way to start the dialogue and start having those difficult conversations and you know, and I think that's why it's very important for indigenous people to start telling our stories now because so much has been taken from us and it's time that we start rebuilding and restoring what has been lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 I'm now Mary Catherine here. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> um, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean that's what I, I would say, I'm, I'm a theater, I'm a theater activist, so my social justice work is theater. Um, I, I can show you, Dozens of reviews over the years are annoy, annoyed with me <laughs> because I do not teach them enough 
and I do not answer the questions I ask in my plays. Um, I always say the second act of my play happens afterwards. If I've done my job as a dramatist, I leave you with more questions than answers, and I leave you with a lot of things you've never thought about, and, um, and I leave you with a lot of things that you have to figure out later, and you have to probably do some work. Ugh, sorry. Um, you're going to have to look things up. You're going to have to do some research. You're going to have to talk to a native person. Yikes. <laughs> um, and so that, that's intentional. And every, pretty much every reviewer of every play I've had hates that. Um, it's fine. Uh, my plays do what I want them to do. And, and I think that's, you know, we all use our work in that way. And that's what theater can do. I, I think the other thing that's important, though, even just um, is that we all um, use women as our central characters. All my plays have a both the main characters a woman in every play I've ever written. Um, I think. I think so. And, and I, I believe that's the same at least every play I've seen of yours, I'm pretty sure, right? I have one play where I was like, you know, I'm going to challenge myself and make the main mm -hmm. character a man. And then I gave him a girlfriend that had like an even more powerful voice. And then at one point I was like, whose play is this? <laughs> right. yeah. She was awesome. And, Del <laughs> and Delana's play is her. So there you go. Although um, my, my father's character still the show. Everyone loves my uh, father's yeah. character. Yeah. yeah. But um, I mean, that's, that's really important, right? Is that we, we do, whether or not we're dealing specifically with uh, the topic of violence mm -hmm. against women, it's important that our native women and all women see strong native women at the center, having their voice told, their voice heard, or other women, mine particular play, this one, the main character is a white woman, um, but we're supposed to laugh at her, so that's okay. Um, but it, it's really important that we all, we all use that. So even if we're not talking about that topic, we are showing, though, um, a different path for a woman, a different way to move through the world. Thank you. Um, we are at a point, so we don't get to stay together all night. I know this might disappoint some of us. Um, but we are at a point where we wanted to open up uh, for some questions from the audience for these ladies. So I'd like to honor that time and allow you as um, audience members to ask some questions, if you'd like. Sure, yeah. Um, so I, I'm, um, I come from South Dakota. Uh, we have a lot of people without electricity, without internet, without heat. Um, and so it makes me crazy. There's so much funding for these film programs to go out there and teach people filmmaking. And what are they going to do with... A, they can't have a $6,000 camera in their home. It's going to get stolen. B, they can't charge the thing. C, they have no internet to upload the thing. I mean, it's just ridiculous. The, I'm sorry, it just makes me crazy. I talked to all these kids back home. They're like, yeah, they brought through all these film programs to teach us about filmmaking. Yep. <laughs> and they go away, and everyone felt good about themselves, and they spent all this money, and they had this great time teaching about filmmaking to a bunch of people that can't make films because they don't have electricity, for goodness sake. Did you not notice there was no electricity? Um, it just makes me insane. Sorry. I get a little nuts with that. So, um, but the one thing that is beautiful and that I constantly am pushing hard is theater. Our native people can make theater anywhere. Our native people, all they need is themselves. The three of us could make a play here right now and perform it, you know, done. And, and, and it can change people's lives, right? Give us 10 minutes, we could write that, write that. And so, you know, that's the thing about theater. It's beautiful. We already know how to perform as native people. We already have been doing theater for thousands of years. But because it has not been codified and written down by academia, it is not considered legitimate theater. Uh, like Western theater, like um, theater in the Far East. You know, these different forms are considered legitimate theater because they're studied in schools and they've been written down but through academia and studied in that way. Ours have not been, and therefore people don't consider it theater. But we do so many amazing, completely different theatrical forms. So all we have to do is just do what we do, right? So the, the um, example I always use is back home, um, actually at Milk's Camp. I was talking to someone earlier from Milk's Camp. Um, from Milk's Camp in uh, Rosebud, uh, these, peop these children, they have um, uh, funding for alcohol and drug um, prevention, abuse prevention. And so they had a little bit of money, so they found a perfect little 
amphitheater in, like, with these prairie hillsides that came down to this bowl. And so they, it's, it's a perfect backdrop. It's acoustically beautiful. They built little wooden benches themselves, and they made all these little benches, and they made a darling little wooden stage. Someone ran a little, uh, an extension cord out there. And so then they also put up a little white wall in the back like this <laughs> so that they can um, show films on there when they don't have theater to watch. Um, and they just make plays out there in the prairie. It's the most beautiful theater I've ever been to. It, the, I remember <laughs> the first time they brought me out there, you know, the cicadas are going at night and the um, sunsets in South Dakota are 360 degrees, like they're all the way around you. And the full moon was coming up over the hill and the horses are coming down and grazing behind you. I mean, it's just, it's magical. And these kids are out there making theater. Um, they brought me out to, you know, in a weekend, we took these children, um, some little people, some, I was telling them earlier about there's two women that came, they're teenage girls raising 10 children, um, none of whom are theirs. Uh, and they're raising them alone without any adults. And, and they just brought all the kids, we put them in, um, in uh, sleeping bags in the garage, and we spent a weekend learning how to write plays, taught them dialogue, taught them how to do scenes. We learned how to write plays, and I sent them out, made them inter interview all their elders, and come back, and we wrote the plays that the elders told us. And um, they performed this little show. It was like 30 minutes long. It was the first time we did this. Um, and I worked with them, teach them how to do this, and how to act and, and do all this. And it was a 30-minute show. It took us like a week. I mean, it's, it's crazy. And these kids had this amazing piece of theater that connected them to their elders, connected their community to their to the land. They had to like add shows because it was so popular. Because <laughs> you know what? There's nothing else to do out there. <laughs> Except, you know, powwow was over. The carnival left. Um, you know, so it was like, it was the entertainment in town. It's amazing. I mean, and so our people can be doing that. I work at Red Cloud Indian School a lot, and they talk constantly about this beautiful theater program they used to have. I'm like, guys, let's just go do it. And so we went back, you know, the theater's there. I'm like, let's go do it. And we went and we did a play there, you know? It's like, it took us three days. We wrote a play, we performed it. You know, it's something Native people can be doing everywhere they are. You don't need electricity, you don't need internet, you don't need fancy equipment, you don't need anything but yourselves. And, and I'm constantly pushing for um, Indian country to get behind theater. It's, it's amazing, it's beautiful, it involves music and dancing and storytelling and all the things we already do. Um, so I really, I'm a big advocate. I was just bugging people, some funders here today, like, support Native theater. Um, we need it, but we don't have funding for it. It's a constant, constant battle to get funding. I, you know, if I had the money, I'd just go out there myself. I'm an artist, I don't have enough money. Um, but I could be doing Native theater workshops year round with our youth um, if I could just get the funding to do it. Uh, any other questions? No, no, no. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you did with that. Were you thinking of maybe doing a multimedia show at first, or did you just use those to help get into the characters of the people you spoke with? Well, originally my show was not about, it was not going to be about me or my father. <laughs> it was about the people we met along the way. And um, so we had all these interviews. Um, even though I'm Cherokee Nation from Oklahoma, we have three federally recognized tribes. There's Cherokee Nation from Oklahoma, there's the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in Cherokee, North Carolina, and the United Katua Band also of Oklahoma. And so even though we're Cherokee, in order for me to tell the stories, I, I went and presented in front of tribal council, I met with the elders, I took a year to build up a relationship with um, Eastern Band, you know, Cherokee, just because they're not, we're, we're different. Um, and so, so the interviews that we collected were supposed to be for the play, and they still are, you know, I still use them, but we, we actually donated them back to all the tribal museums. So anyone that we met with along the way, and also to the Trail of Tears Association, um, you know, we wanted the footage, I wanted it mostly so I could, for the writing purposes, because like I said, my, my original thought was the play was not gonna be about me or my father, it was gonna be about the people we met along the way, and then my director's like, but people are interested about what's a, what was it like to retrace your family's footsteps along the Trail of Tears with your dad. I was like, oh yeah, that's, no, we don't talk about that. <laughs> so they made me go a little further. So, um, so the whole idea of having the, the documentary, if you watch the footage, what's funny about it is there are no interviews with, with me and my father because we weren't supposed to be in the play. And, um, but then in order to, I, it was my director, it was her idea, she said, if they see the, if, if you go out there and you become uh, personally vulnerable and you share your story, 
then people are going to be able to relate to it more than you sharing the stories of other people. And that's your obligation to your people. And it, it, my, my director is a white lady, well-intentioned. Uh, we actually call her the Yoneg with good intentions. Yoneg <laughs> is a Cherokee word for a white person. Okay. <laughs> and so my Yoneg with good intentions, you know, that's what ended up happening. Is she, she forced me to tell the deeper story, and I kind of went kicking and screaming into it. And then... <laughs> <laughs> you and your hair. I know. Okay. God. <laughs> what is happening? Thank you. So that's how it happened. But, um, but all the interviews are with, uh, it's at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian, it's at the Cherokee Heritage Center, it's also at the uh, Junaluska Museum and the Museum of the, Cher of, of the Sequoia Birthplace, and then also with the Trail of Tears Association. So they have all of our interviews. And we had some really big ones, like I got to interview um, our beloved man who just passed, uh, Jerry Wolf. Jerry Wolf was the first beloved man to have that title in over 200 years. And he passed away uh, my first week of rehearsal. And um, we also were able to interview uh, Dr. Amanda Swimmer, who is a revered elder, and she was recently named a beloved woman. And I think that was probably my proudest moment is because she offered to do her interview in Cherokee. And my father got to speak with one of the oldest living speakers of the Cherokee language. And that, for me, that was what the trail was all about. Mm. Any other questions? What's beloved man and beloved woman? Uh, it's just the highest title uh, that you could have bestowed on someone. So it's, uh, so it's, so you know, elder is a, a title. And I always joke, it's like, I'm not ever gonna be an elder, I'll just be old. I'm <laughs> not ever gonna have that wisdom. <laughs> I'm just gonna be an old person. Um, but elder, a beloved man and beloved woman usually go to our most uh, cherished and trusted culture bearers. Like, they've done enough in their life to, to keep the, like, once they're gone, then we lose a part of the culture. And so it's acknowledging how much they've given back to the community. How, you know, it's, it's once again that, that word gadugi, right? How much they've given back, how much they've, and you know, in Jerry Wolf's case, Jerry Wolf, I mean, he was just, he was a phenomenal human being. He, um, he stormed the beaches of Normandy, um, one of the only natives people to do that and survive. And he, um, he's, you know, he's a, he's a, he would teach the language. He was also one of our best storytellers. He had the most stories. So, um, you know, oral history, the way, it's, the way it works is in a lot of cultures, but especially in Cherokee, if you can't tell the story the correct way, then you're not allowed to tell the story. And so you collect stories along the way. Now, we also adapt stories. And, we're, you know, sometimes we'll tell a shortened version because our creation story takes, like, several days. <laughs> no one really had. So you find a short, shorter way to saying it. Um, but, you know, you, you have to earn that right to shorten it. You have to earn that right. And so, um, but Jerry had, he, he was such a wealth of knowledge. He had, like, in his, in his mind, in his brain, he had so many of our stories. And he had the, the full length and the short length. And he, he could masterfully tell those. In fact, um, after he retired, he would go to the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. And during the lunch break, all the tourists would come out and he would tell them stories. And then eventually the museum I was like, oh, this is great. We should hire him. He's a great ambassador for the program. And so, um, and then, of course, you get Dr. Amanda Swimmer, who is also an old speaker, uh, which means Cherokee is her first language. And, but she's also um, one of our best potters. And she still does her pottery the old way. And so we were able to, uh, she showed us how she made her pots. We were able to watch that. And then she tried to teach me how to do some Cherokee finger weaving. I, I'm not very good at that, but I'm it, terrible, it was, horrible. It was, I was like, how are you, it's, so it's the beloved man and beloved woman, those are titles bestowed on people who um, are our culture bearers and they have such wealth of knowledge that once they're gone, we lose a piece of ourselves. And that's why we don't give out that title that often. Any other questions out there? Well, this has just been a wonderful, uh, this isn't working again. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a wonderful evening. I want to thank everybody for coming up. I especially want to thank all four of these amazing ladies. How about a round of applause? <laughs> just a little something for you to take with you. Uh, it's a May of 
t-shirt and some sweet grass and some sage and just a gift from the Native community of Portland. Thank you again. Thank you so much. So before we let everybody go, because I'm, I'm sure folks would like to mingle and ask questions um, and just chat, I just want to remind folks that you've got three plays that are happening here in Oregon all at the same time, which is really, really great. So before we check out, I'd like to just ask you just a quick plug. Let us know um, where your play is, um, when it's, when it's going to run to, maybe just a slight two sentence about what it is so that everyone here knows what you should be planning in the next couple of months. And one of those things is a road trip to Ashland, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my play is Manhattan, and it's um, at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in Ashland, Oregon right now through October 27th. So you got time to figure out your trip down there. And Manhattan follows the story of Jane Snake, who is a contemporary citizen of the Delaware Nation from Anadarko, Oklahoma. And it is her journey back to Manhattan, her ancestral homeland, where she works and gets a job at Lehman Brothers and works on Wall Street, which is named Wall Street because that's where the Dutch built a wall to forcibly remove her people from their homelands in 1654. And so it goes back and forth in time as you see her reconnect with her ancestors and, and, and where she comes from. So my play is called And So We Walked. And it's at Portland Center Stage until May 13th, although I just found out today it's selling really well, so we might extend, so um, get your tickets quickly. Um, this is very exciting. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, it was like when I wrote the play, I thought I would go to tribal institutions and, you know, tribal colleges. I, I you know, I always joke and say, you know, Portland Center Stage, I would like to say it's a dream come true, but it's honestly, I, I never dreamed that I would even get that far, so. It's more than a dream come true. Um, and, but, and so we walked is basically, it's, a, it's me retelling, retracing my family's footsteps along the northern route of the Trail of Tears with my father and our six weeks on the road and uh, what came up for us along the way. So if you want to know all my dirty secrets, you should see the show. <laughs> And my play is the Thanksgiving play. It's a comedy and satire, um, so come to mind and just laugh a lot. People tell me their face hurts and their stomach hurts when they're done, so it's a bit of a workout, be ready. Um, and it's an artist repertory theater. Uh, it's only until April 29th, so you gotta go now. Get on it. Um, it's pretty quick. And um, we have a code, uh, Keisha, I think back here. Thanksgiving on your 35. Thanksgiving 35. Use that code and you get $35 tickets to any show. Um, we also reserve tickets for elders every night, so you'll, you will get in. Um, and so, yeah, Thanksgiving 35, just use that and get your discount tickets. It's, uh, it's about all the white people you know in Portland. Um, that's what it's about. And it's a lot of fun and it's goofy. So just come and have fun. Okay, thank you. Before we leave, let's give these ladies another round of applause. have some time just to chat before we have to close up shop here. I'll leave that to, to you to let us know when we got to go. So, all right, thank you. It was like, when I wrote the play, I thought I would go to tribal institutions and, you know, tribal colleges. I, I you know, I always joke and say, you know, Portland Center Stage, I would like to say it's a dream come true, but it's honestly, I, I never dreamed that I would even get that far. So. It's more than a dream come true. Um, and, but, and so we walked is basically, it's, a, it's me retelling, retracing my family's footsteps along the northern route of the Trail of Tears with my father and our six weeks on the road and uh, what came up for us along the way. So if you want to know all my dirty secrets, you should see the show. <laughs> And my play is the Thanksgiving play. It's a comedy and satire, um, so come to mind and just laugh a lot. People tell me their face hurts and their stomach hurts when they're done, so it's a bit of a workout, be ready. Um, and it's an artist repertory theater. Uh, it's only until April 29th, so you gotta go now. Get on it. Um, it's pretty quick. And um, we have a code, uh, Keisha, I think back here. Thanksgiving on your 35. Thanksgiving 35. Use that code and you get $35 tickets to any show. Um, we also reserve tickets for elders every night, so you'll, you will get in. 
Um, and so yeah, Thanksgiving 35, just use that and get your discount tickets. It's, uh, it's about all the white people you know in Portland. Um, that's what it's about. And it's a lot of fun and scoopy. So just come and have fun. Okay, thank you. Before we leave, let's give these ladies another round of applause. Have some time just to chat before we have to close up shop here. I'll leave that to, to you to let us know when we got to go. So, all right, thank you. <laughs>